Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one. Therefore God has joined together. Let not man put asunder. Do you see that? Do you see that? Okay. So the, the oneness here is also oneness of flesh. So they become one flesh. But I say that oneness in every other respect is supposed to be consequent upon this, is anticipated. Now, this is a very powerful issue in understanding the nature of marriage because when two people um, are married, when two people are joined together in holy matrimony, and they are not able to consummate. So when you... Um, when you come to a church service or a marriage ceremony, however you do it, but from a Christian standpoint, so it's a Christian wedding ceremony. When you have a wedding ceremony and we pronounce the man and the woman, man and wife, and all of that. Now, if uh, prior to that time, for instance, let's say that the man in question, uh, the brother now in question, because we're using church language, the brother in question was important, but did not disclose to the, to the sister. And then they go ahead to be pronounced man and wife, all right? Only for the lady to realize after marriage that the man is important and therefore they are not able to consummate the marriage. If the sister decides that she does not want to continue with this situation, what will happen is not that the marriage will be divorced. They will not have a divorce. They will have an annulment. All right, and an annulment is different from a divorce in the sense that in annulling a marriage, you are simply saying that it never happened. That means that this thing was not did not happen. You remember those of you that know 93 June 12th, that was what the head of state did at the time. He did not cancel the election, he annulled it. That, that was almost to say the people that went out under the sun and killed, and like it didn't happen. That's the meaning of annulment. You don't, de it is not a divorce, it is an annulment. Why? Because, technically speaking, all right, the marriage was not complete, the marriage really never took place. Huh? They did not become one flesh. That consummation is the one flesh that the Bible talks about. And without that, you, you practically speaking, the marriage is not complete. So when somebody now says, I don't want to continue in this, what is done is that the marriage is annulled. There are a few cases under which, uh, fr from a legal standpoint that is, under which annulment uh, uh, is, is allowed. This, even this would be one of those grounds legally. All right? Uh, legally, it's different from biblically. Biblically, this is definitely one. Now, but if you're even talking legally, sometimes when, uh, let's say, two siblings, unknown to each other, because, you know, maybe their mom had them for different persons and they never met, married here and traveled to another state and had another husband and that kind of thing. And then they met while they were schooling, you know, in Nashville, Tennessee, in the United States of America. And then they fall in love and they got married in the U.S. All right? Eventually, the person says, ah, I need to show you to my people, show you to my people. And then they realize that they are children of the same mother, that the same woman had given birth to them. Occasionally in history, those kinds of things happen. When that happens and you want to like bring an end to the union, what actually is done legally, at least, is what? It's an annulment. It's not a divorce. Because the idea is that this thing was never meant to have happened. So this marriage never happened. Because these are siblings. 
Do you get the principle of annulment now? Now, that issue, this principle of annulment, is what is applied if consummation does not happen, biblically speaking, because consummation is, as it is called, it is the way that the marriage is consummated. The Bible says that, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall become one flesh. Which means, I'm trying to help you to understand, I said I'm looking at the nature of marriage. Because you need to understand why divorce and remarriage is such a big deal. Somebody was asking me the question that, are we, uh, the Bible says, thou shalt not mother, or something like that. The Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. That if somebody's life is uh, in jeopardy, and the person is being physically abused to the point that this person could die, are we saying that, it is supposed to be treated lightly, more lightly than we would treat adultery, seeing that both of them are condemned with the same force. All right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not uh, 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 commit murder. Okay? Why would we allow a, a situation where adultery happens to warrant divorce and remarriage and a situation where murder is about to happen to not warrant divorce and remarriage. Those kinds of reasonings are good reasoning. They sound good. A very simple principle for Bible interpretation is that where there are specific principles, you do not apply generics. Is that okay? Where the Bible mentions something specifically, you no longer treat that thing with a general principle that you find in Scripture. A very popular example, resist the devil and he will flee away from you. But the Bible says flee fornication. Are you with me? Now, if, if for instance, we're never told to flee fornication, you can say fornication is a demonic thing, is a devilish thing, is a demonic whatever, and you want to resist it. The reason why you cannot apply the resistance principle to fornication is because it has been singled out and a specific treatment has been given to it. Therefore, general principle will no longer apply to it. If the Bible is silent about a matter, then you look for the umbrella principle that you can apply to that matter. But where there are specific pronouncements made in Scripture concerning a matter, you no longer use general principle. Are you with me? So, the fact that the marriage question is a question that was asked Jesus very specifically, and one to which Jesus answered very specifically, puts it in a category all of its own, so that all of the usual uh, 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 general application of principles that we would love to apply would no longer be tenable because it has been specifically treated by Jesus because it was specifically singled out and queried of Jesus. Now, I'm still looking at the nature of marriage. So, realize therefore that this thing that is called consummation is such a big deal, such a big deal, that without it, you literally are still not married in the ultimate sense of the word. I'm choosing my words very carefully, right? I've seen situations, I've heard of situations where there was no consummation. I think either because both of them understood, they had an understanding or something, they believed God and all of that. And um, it was almost like a decade before God finally intervened in the brother's life. Now, I have heard of a testimony like that. So I'm saying that ultimately, in the, in the, in the ultimate sense of the word, the marriage can be annulled if consummation is impossible. Is that okay? And it will not be called a divorce. That's supposed to tell you something about the nature of the centrality of intercourse in a marriage. So much that almost as if to say that the very definition of a marriage is tied to it. Are you with me? That without it, something that obviously looks like a marriage can quickly be pronounced to not be a marriage and it will be so in the sight of God. Are you with me? So I'm looking at the nature, the nature of marriage. What kind of thing 
is marriage. 